I want to welcome everyone this to this week's Cruel Justice, uh, empowered by Witness the Innocent. Uh, and unfortunately, we're having a couple of problems, so we didn't go live, but we are going to continue our show. Uh, today, you know, we want to hear from the family side. As we discussed uh, many times before, the death penalty creates uh, victims on both sides. You know, you have the victim family member going through it, and many times people don't consider the family members of the one that is accused. Excuse me. So today, I want to talk about uh, Paul House. As you can see on my screen, I've met Paul and his mom plenty of times today. We have his mom on the show and she'll give us a little bit about what she went through. But Paul House served 22 years on Tennessee death row before evidence in his innocence and the intervention of the US Supreme Court cleared him of a murder and led to his release. This information that I'm reading to you from is from the Innocent Project, on the Innocent Project website. So just to be known, uh, we're doing this. Uh, and the crime, in the summer of 1985, Karen Muncy was found dead near her home in a rural, um, the Terrell, Tennessee, dressed in a nightgown and a house coat. Her bloody body was found under some brush and on the bank of a creek. She had been raped and beaten. A few months before Muncie's um, murder, Paul House had moved into his mother's house nearby who we have today. Almost immediately after the incident, police suspected that House and an outsider with a criminal record, an outsider with a criminal record was responsible for Muncie's death. The conviction. At trial, two witnesses for the state testified they had seen House wiping his hands on the night of the crime near where Muncie had been found. A pair of jeans collected from the house had blood on them and a forensic expert testified at trial that the um, bloody match, the blood match Muncie ABO blood type. The forensic experts also testified that the house blood type matched the semen on the Muncie underwear. In 1986, the jury convicted House of first degree murder and sentenced him to death. At post conviction, while House attorneys were appealing his uh, conviction, several witnesses came forward with evidence that the victim abusive hus husband had killed her. Two women claimed that Mr. Muncie had confessed to the crime at a party one night. A third woman saw him hitting his wife at a death. A fourth said he had asked her to provide an alibi for him on the night of his wife was killed. Further analysts of the blood on house genes cast doubt on whether the blood was actually deposited during the course of the crime. This included testimony from former Tennessee State Medical Examiner who stated that in his view, the blood on the genes showed eczema decay, which he testified was consistent with blood taking at Miss, Miss Mancy autopsy and transported in vials without per preserves or refrigeration. The K would not be expected to be found in blood that came directly in contact with the house pants, with house pants while the victim was alive. Additional evidence supported the theory that blood collected at Muncie autopsy had spilled on his jeans after they were collected as evidence, whether accidentally or deliberately. The blood vials were not sealed and were driven 10 hours to the FBI lab by the two law enforcement officers. The blood spoiled, spoiled during the trip due to heat exhaustion, heat exposure, and the FBI records show that a significant amount of blood from the autopsy vials was missing when officers arrived at the lab. More exploratory evidence came in, in the late 1990s after House had spent over a decade in prison. Advanced DNA testing revealed the, that the same semen from Muncie underwear and nightgown belonged to her husband, not House. 
contrary to the testimony of the FBI expert at trial who had incorrectly told the jury that only house blood group, group ad, 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 adagens could have been the source of the semen stain. House appeals, which called for his conviction to be overturned in light of the array of new evidence was rejected by several courts before his case was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. In 2005, the Incident Project filed a friend of court brief on the, his behalf in the Supreme Court. On June 12, 2006, the court ruled that the reasonable jury would probably not have convicted House had they have been aware of the evidence of his favor and spent his case, sent his case back to the District Court of Tennessee for further review. In Tennessee, U.S. District Court Judge Eric McTreese Jr. overturned House conviction and ordered the state to either release House or retry him within 180 days. The state appealed decision but lost. Bail was set at 500000 then reduced to 100000 and The numbness donor paid the 10% bond and House who suffers from chronic multiple cirrhosis and his confined is confined to a wheelchair with release from the Lois M. B. Berry Special Needs Facility on July 2nd. And he served, he had served 22 years on death row. Just one second, let me stop sharing. So if we may analyze what I just read on this show. You know, basically what happened was as plain as day. Um, when the murder happened, uh, some investigating officers must have, have uh, mistakenly <laughs> uh, took the blood from the victim uh, at doing the autopsy and spilled it on Mr. House jeans and then um, considered him as the person who actually killed the, killed the victim which we have a lot of this goes on to still today where people, um, police officers be trying to make a case and actually <clears throat> actually cause um, a great, great mental uh, harm by creating a new victim by wrongfully accus accusing someone. Now, going through this, I can, I can only imagine as a parent uh, how a person would feel uh, seeing their child going through this, knowing their child is innocent and a wait of 22 years. So Ms. Joyce, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you uh, introduce yourself, tell the people who you are? Do what? Can you tell the people your name and who you are? Uh, George House, and I'm Paul House's mother. I, I know this is difficult to talk about. I know you have the great joy of having your son back. But when he was going through all of that, how was you feeling? I mean, what was your thoughts? I was devastated, but I went to... All the trials, they, you know, all the appeals, to hear all the appeals, and all over the state of Tennessee, and uh, then cried all the way home when nothing happened because uh, the state just was not, you know, they believed he was guilty, and that was it. And until uh, the... Uh, Federal took over. Well, they did. They had all the appeals, and then they said it's got to go to the federal. And and the guys in the prison was telling Greg, "Don't let it go to the federal because uh, they'll execute you." And uh, I finally I told Greg, I said, "We got to do something, so let's let it go to the federal." And uh, we got the uh, TV reporters involved and and uh, 
got his story out there, and people started believing it then. And uh, then uh, the federal uh, defense team uh, decided to take it to the Supreme Court. And when they heard it, they said uh, if they had heard all the evidence in the trial, there is no way that he would have been convicted. And so that gave us hope. But then it was another 10 years before, well, not, not hardly 10 years, but it seemed like it, that uh, it went on and on. And uh, But whenever we took it, whenever it went to federal, I told Greg, I said, the state put you in here and the state's going to keep you in here. They're not going to admit their mistake. So we got to do this. And so... Uh, he had a really good um, attorney that believed in him and fought for him. And uh, uh, when it went to federal, then I asked uh, his attorney, Mr. Kissinger, I said, how many times have you taken uh, cases to the Supreme Court? And he said, this is my first one. And I said, oh, my goodness, I would have just fainted if I'd have known that. But you won. <laughs> And uh, uh, it was, Greg was just, uh, Paul was just, uh, I mean, he, he just kept, every time I'd go visit him, he'd say, I didn't do anything, Mom, why am I here? And then after about 10 years, then he started getting sick. And he came down with, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, MS. and. Uh, so, and I said, you know, he walked in there, a uh, innocent man, and he was brought out in a wheelchair, an innocent man. And but whenever I, whenever I went to get him, they said he could come home. Uh, he was sitting in this little room, and uh, a guard was standing there with him. And I walked in. He goes, Mom. The guard tells me I'm going home. I said, yeah, you're going home. And uh, so then on the way home, he said, oh, it's so pretty out here. He said, it's a lot prettier going going this way than it was going back the other way. <laughs> but, uh, and then the prosecutor was going to retry him after that. And, and it was another year before... Uh, he finally dropped all the charges, and uh, Greg got to come home, but he, he had to wear an ankle bracelet for a year, and uh, that uh, they wanted him to have an MRI, and I took him down for his MRI, and they said, we can't do it because he's got that ankle bracelet on. So I called the lady that was in charge of that, and, and she said, uh, how come you didn't cut that thing off and I said I wasn't about to cut it off I didn't want him to get in trouble and she said well you take it off and then you take him back down there and get his MRI and uh, and then I one time I asked her if uh, I told well I had to call her when I went to the doctor take him to the doctor and uh, this one doctor was treating him uh, for nothing because he didn't have insurance and uh, I took him I had to take him to Nashville and I took him to Nashville and uh, the doctor it so happened there was a the head of the Social Security was there and the doctor told him he said I want you to meet somebody and he told he said he's been on um, Tennessee's death row for uh, 23 years and uh, this is, uh, he came out in a wheelchair, and that Social Security guy said, he said, I'm treating him because he didn't have insurance. And that Social Security guy said, he come over there and he shook his hand and apologized to him. He said, you know, the justice system does make mistakes. And uh, then he said, he gave me his card, and he said, when you get home, you call this number. and 
everything will be set up. He'll have insurance and get SSI. And so I caught when I called the Social Security, they said, "Is this the Paul House we've been seeing on TV?" And I said, uh, "Yeah." And they said, "Everything's fine." I didn't even have to go to the Social Security office or anything. And uh, and now he he is bedridden. Um, we get him up in the mornings, and there's a lady comes over and gives him his sponge bath and takes his bottles and and uh, 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 there's a doctor that comes to see him. We don't have to take him out. And uh, but he has a really good attitude. He always. If he's asleep when she comes over and she pulls on his toe and wakes him up and and he starts laughing, she said, I wish all my patients was like this. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm listening to you right now and, you know, I, I and, and this is why I'm not so bitter because, you know, uh, God does a, a lot of great things and do a lot of amazing things. And, uh, um, I haven't I haven't heard you say that the state gave him any compensation. Did the state compensate him? No, he's never been he hasn't been compensated. Now um the uh TADP, Tennesseans Against the Death Penalty, uh before this pandemic they had a they would have just to stay on the hill mm-hmm. and we'd go um before uh Paul got out. Uh, I would go and and speak to uh, state representatives, and uh, <clears throat> then uh, whenever he got out, oh, there was a lot of them that uh, this one state representative was reading the book on uh, uh, this one book about an innocent man, and he said whenever he said I had been uh, reading up on Greg's uh, or Paul's. Uh, uh, story and he said whenever I finished that book I looked at my wife and said this could be Paul House because he's in there and he's innocent and he went to see him uh, at the prison even one of the state representatives and uh, he told me whenever I went to just to stay on the hill he said I went to visit Paul and uh, he said uh I uh, talked to him. Well, Paul thought he was a reporter, and he was he was talking to him, and and he said, uh, "Boy, that Paul is really a Democrat, isn't he?" And I said, "Oh yeah." And he said, uh, "When I walked down there, I thought I, I said to myself, thank God I'm a Democrat,' because <laughs> he would <laughs> he would have really uh, uh, upset me, but." Uh, and then uh, he uh, and he he did fight for him. If there was a, some of them said, "I don't care what you say," you know, I, I don't want to hear it. And I took I went to see my state representative, and he said, "I know why you're here." And he said, uh, "I believe in the death penalty, and that's it." And I had the when I went in, I had the, what the Supreme Court had said. I said, well, do you believe the Supreme Court? He said, yeah, and I, I handed him the paper, and he read it, and he said, hey, if the Supreme Court thinks he's innocent, then I think he's innocent, too. And uh, and then after uh, Paul got out, I took him to just to stay on the hill. And uh, all of them were coming around, you know, and and this one lady, this one uh, lady representative, she got down on her knees and she said, I am so sorry for what happened to you. And uh, she talked to him for a long time. And and then we took him in. Uh, this lady at MTSU wanted to, she said, can we, can I, uh, will you go with, uh, me to take Paul to visit my state representative and we went down uh, we went to visit him and he was sitting there and she she said uh, 
um, I brought Paul House in here to meet you. He said, well, I am glad because he's more famous today than a, a rock. He's more famous here than a rock star. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and then they agreed that they, you know, the ones I talked to agreed he, they should, he should be compensated. And I said, yeah, I told that one state representative, I said, yeah, you agree. And you made these laws before DNA came out to prove that these guys are innocent. And then now you don't want to live up to them. And he said, I understand what you're saying. And I said, you know, I'm right. And, uh, but uh, the first time I went to see the, um, went to Justice Day on the Hill, Ray Crone had gone with us. He, he had come in and, and he spoke, uh, at, uh, the first speaking I had ever done was with Ray, and uh, we went to MTSU and uh, spoke at the college there in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, but uh, he gave me a lot of pointers, so he, you know, he kind of helped me along because I was kind of nervous, <laughs> but uh, it... Uh, it was quite a uh, 23 years of a trip. We're coming cl close to a, um, the end of time uh, with the show. We started late, so I'm ending late. But I want to sum this up for uh, most of the viewers. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to sit here and hear some of these stories also. You know, like I tell people, my story is not so unique. It's, it's so many more stories out there and so many things. And here it is, the mom is going through it from the beginning to the end until still to this day. And it's like she's also was a victim because now she has to take care of her son uh, who walked into prison but came out of prison with a wheelchair in a wheelchair. Um, as much 22 of his years uh, that he could have been enjoying his life before his disease kicked in, it was taken away from him. But yet, still to the day, uh, the state has not lived up to their responsibility and accepting uh, what they have done uh, as a, a, a creating a victim and giving him some type of com uh, compensation. Likely, sometimes we have, uh, being an exoneree, we have people in society that reach out and help us um, where uh, the state failed to help us. You know, for instance, in this case, God blessed him. We had a, a doctor that uh, accepted him without insurance and was taking care of him. Uh, then he likely met the person who was like head of Social Security and he was able to set things up for him um, and you have people that's in the society that's doing this good work and and helping um, uh, these exonerees because um, once the state do what they do to them um, and sentence them to die when they get proven that they're wrong and they shouldn't have not been convicted and it's usually by a high court for in my case my case came the first case in history where all seven judges of the Florida Supreme Court ruled that I shouldn't have never even been convicted here. In his case, it was the U.S. Supreme Court that ruled that um, he shouldn't have been um, uh, convicted. And yet the state, uh, instead of uh, honoring the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal court by um, taking him to trial within 80 days or dropping the charges, um, they waited a whole nother year, uh, uh, putting him on a ban, uh, uh, making it difficult for him to go to a doctor and get an MRI when he shouldn't even been on that. You know, they make you suffer a little bit more after um, um, it's, it's shown that you shouldn't be, uh, it, it's shown that the state got it wrong, but instead of the state admitting that they got it wrong, they sometimes fight still fight and knowing all the evidence point to someone else. Um, 
I don't get this. I never will get this. Uh, but here, you know, um, witness innocent. This is a daily life for us. You know, we we are an organization that's built of many different or um, exonerees and part of our programs is a peer specialist program where we um, have to like counsel ourselves uh, by conversating with each other. And, you know, uh, we have to put what we're going through to the side to um, be there for the other one that is going through it right now. And, you know, and, and, and the cycle just keeps switching spots. So people don't understand the, the difficulties of that, but to actually, uh, I think, uh, I, I think in this case also that the mom should be compensated because here she is now has to take care of her son at an older age and he's uh, in a wheelchair and, you know, she has to drive him around to the doctor and things like that when, you know, when if he had not been uh, wrongfully convicted, he maybe have uh, uh, spotted the, the the problem. The doctors could have spotted the problems before, and and he could have had treatment to prevent him at the felling stage he's at. Um, and it's a lot. It's a lot that people don't really get with this, and uh, you know, and it's it's, it's not just um, uh, uh, wrongful convictions. It's a lot of things that um, the state does that uh, you know. Uh, create victims, even police officers correct, uh, uh, creating victims and, you know, administrative uh, departments, people filing for a disability is not getting disability. It's a lot. And the thing about it is the senators and legislators and House representatives, they have the power to in, implement uh, laws and rules to say, hey, if the state makes a mistake like this and creates a victim, let's find a way to help this victim, not just put this victim out there and say, hey, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. You know, some point these states has to take responsibility <laughs> and put something intact to, to compensate for what is happening to these people spending all this time in, in prison and it's, it's not, is I mean you have to look at when you're wrongfully convicted when you're sitting in death row, you know the for for me the money my mom had to sacrifice to send it for commissary so I can eat or get the personal things I need, you know the the money they had to pay to come visit the phone calls, you know all that adds up and that's a, that's a toll on our family, you know that in some sense you know. It, it, it's, 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 it's gone, you know, it's, it's, it's gone, you know, you can't, you can't uh, bring that back. But with that said, you know, I, I can go on and on all day um, because I'm feeling this and this story yeah. is touching me. But I'm, I have 30 minutes and I'm supposed to have been off this show. So I'm going to bring this show to an end. You know, feel free to contact us at witnessinnocent.org. Uh, on our website, you can find all the information now how to contact um, the organization, different death row exonerees. You know, you're welcome to, you know, call or uh, email and, and ask to speak to an exoneree or you can bring them to your church and uh, things like that and, you know, help with your other groups and stuff like that. So feel free to contact witnesses.org. You can also contact me at H. Lindsay. Uh, at hlindsay at witnessinnocent.org is my personal email there. Um, so, you know, with that being said, I want to thank everybody for this week, crew, unusual, uh, crew justice empowered by Witness the Innocent. Uh, I'm very sorry about the technical part where we can't go live and see the comments and things like that, but the video is going to be posted. And we will appreciate if you would, um, as you view the, the, the video, please feel free to insert any comments or anything, and we will gladly uh, address them uh, through the comments also. So thank you all for joining me until next episode. So long.